Hello, church. It is a privilege to walk together, serving Jesus, worshiping Him, praising Him together with you guys. Thank you for joining in again today. We're reading Psalm 123, 4, and 5, and not a lot of verses, but just like Kevin said yesterday, what a lot of content. And so I would encourage you, uh, spend extra time with the Lord in prayer. Here's a couple of places that if you didn't already find something to launch into praise for, here are some examples. In Psalm 123, verse 2, the end of chapter, uh, verse 2 and into the beginning of verse 3, it talks about God's mercy. Um, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. And there's a difference between grace and mercy. We are in some ways beneficiaries of both, but grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Like Ephesians 2 says, we are saved by grace. We get salvation, although it is something that we cannot earn. And so we are recipients or beneficiaries of the grace of the Lord. At the same time, God is merciful. And so mercy is a little bit different than grace because while grace is getting something that you don't deserve, mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. And we're also beneficiaries of that. If you think about uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 6, 23, we know that all of us have sinned and the wages of sin is death. In other words, that's talking about a spiritual, eternal death apart from Christ in which we actually deserve ongoing misery and ruin with spiritual death for all of eternity. And that is what we deserve, and yet God is merciful. We don't get it if we appeal to him for salvation. And so we recognize that, um, and maybe I'll park there for just a second and say, watch out that you don't fall prey to any false version of Christianity that would make more, that would do little while people are alive to live according to the Bible, but then after someone is dead, really beg God for mercy. That is unbiblical. Rather, we should do what the Bible says, some of the references I just mentioned. We should even park on Luke 6, that where Jesus said, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And so this is not just wishful thinking here in Psalm 123 about God's mercy. He is mercy and he is merciful. That should fill us with praise for who he is and also inspire us to how to live. And so you might ask the Lord, the, uh, the Lord a question like this today and say, Lord Jesus, in a way that would reflect your mercy, who can I show mercy to today? And then in Psalm 124, verse 1 and 2 make me a tiny bit nervous. Because I get nervous when I hear Christians using language like, Oh, God's on my side. And here it says, uh, if the Lord had not been on, on our side twice. I get nervous because God is not on our side in the sense that we can go around, Christians can do whatever they want because God's got our back. Uh, we got to be careful there, church. Here's how it really, here's reality. Remember in Joshua chapter 5, the angel came to Joshua and Joshua asked, he had a, the angel had a sword, sword drawn and Joshua, Joshua asks him, on whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? And the angel, the most terrifying thing ever, says, neither. As a commander of the Lord's army, I've now come. Oh, that's reality right there, church. In John uh, 17, Jesus prays. He asks for our protection from the evil one. In Luke 10, he again promises our protection from the evil one. The reality is that there are only two sides in the spiritual battle in which we're in. There's God's side and Satan's side. And we ought to be, as Christians, on God's side. If we are on God's side and as his servants of the ultimate king of kings, we as his servants, as his soldiers, if our purposes and our objectives now line up perfectly with his, then it is true that God is on our side because he promises that nothing will harm us in that sense. But what a critical thing to remember. The, the question that really kind of stares us in the face is this. Maybe even spend some time with the Lord and ask him, Lord, are the objectives of my side the same as your side? I want to serve you wholeheartedly. Something along that line. Celebrate that with the Lord. And then I want to just mention something in Psalm 125. It says in verse 3 that the scepter of the wicked will not remain. This makes me 
like it, it, it's maybe a little bit sadistic of me, but it kind of makes me chuckle a little bit because we know lots of people. So the scepter, for instance, is this short uh, staff that a king would hold and it represented, it was symbolic of sovereign power. You'll remember in Esther chapter four, she was nervous about approaching the king because if the king didn't hold out the scepter to her, that was a symbol of his sovereign power and that was a symbol of her being able to come into his presence, she would be killed. She was nervous about it. And so, but here it says the scepter of the wicked. In other words, the power of the wicked will not remain. It's all temporary. And so you and I, we could easily come up with a list of wicked kings, as it were. Let's just call them politicians or world leaders of some kind. We got all kinds of wicked kings and leaders today. But their scepter is not going to remain. Church, we need to glory in the fact that Romans 13 would describe that God has put them there on purpose, but it's only going to use them temporarily. Because ultimately, his power is the one that's going to reign. And in Revelation chapter 2, we even have a role to play in this because he tells us that in the future, in eternity, he, for those who overcome and do his will to the end of their lives, he is actually going to give them an iron scepter, a scepter that will be far more powerful than this scepter that's temporary. And ultimately, it's the Lord who has the ultimate scepter that will last for all of eternity. And if you want to be in a place, if it makes you nervous thinking about politics today, and you're wondering a little bit what's going to happen if so-and-so gets in power, remember this. If you want to be unshaken and undeterred, you need to have your trust in the Lord, just like verse 1 says. Those who trust in the Lord are unshakable because his kingdom is one that endures forever. And so you might spend some time asking the Lord this question. Lord, on whose kingdom am I focused? A temporary wicked one or on yours that's eternal? and spend some time with Jesus about that today.